Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode three of the Ancient Coin Hour. How are you guys doing today? It's been a little while. We haven't talked in a couple of weeks, and uh, we've been dying to get you some more info and some more content. So we've been working in the background, been interviewing and uh, writing up things that we think you might find interesting. Uh, and of course, I'd like to welcome my uh, partner, Josh. Hey. Uh, and How's it going? How are you doing today? Uh, doing great, Dean. Doing great. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and uh, we're we're here just to talk about uh, ancient coins. So if you have not been a part of this yet, uh, we go into a lot of detail about what uh, a new collector or an experienced collector can learn uh, from other collectors and try to help you along your journey to try and find uh the right kind of coins and the right kind of information for your hobby. And so we, we generate a podcast every hour or uh, every couple of weeks to try and take you through all of the craziness that is the ancient coin market and try to make it easier, or at least more palatable for, for the rest of us collectors mm -hmm. and how we can help you. So with that being said, Josh uh, has been a very busy guy. He's going to talk a little bit about the Ptolemies, but we have a great lead in on that. Uh, Josh has been performing at the Chicago Lyric Opera mm -hmm. uh, for this is the second performance. His first uh, when we when I first met Josh, Josh was working at the Met and he continues to have uh, repeat performances there and then across the world. So he's a very successful opera singer. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, tell us about Aida. Yeah, sure. So Aida is an incredible, incredible opera written in the late 1800s by Verdi. And it's just an opera that takes place in ancient Egypt, a place that, that I love. And um, it's a big love story about a Ethiopian princess who falls in love with uh, the hero of the Egyptians. And it's their love story and tragedy at the end when uh, they're both cast into a tomb to uh, die a lonely, dark, uh, <laughs> dark existence, except, oh, they're wow, yeah. except they're together. So they sing this beautiful, <laughs> beautiful finale. And uh, it's a wonderful opera. It's going on from now through the middle of April in Chicago. So it should be really good. So if you get a chance and you're in the Chicagoland area, make sure you check it out. Uh, get to see Josh, your favorite coin podcaster, perform <laughs> uh, as a part of the Ensemble Choir. Uh, and uh, there'll be so many more performances. So very excited. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll start this episode out. Uh, we have a very important interview. Uh, somebody that's a, a legend in the industry, let's say. Uh, somebody who's a legend in a lot of industries. Probably somebody that you'll hear their name and maybe not get the reference to who it is. Uh, we wanted to connect you guys with Mr. Hendon, David Hendon. Uh, because he is a wealth of information mm. and he he's very specific uh, in some of his collect or his areas, uh, particularly around Judean coins and biblical coins that he you would consider him the, the foremost expert on. And that is generally where people uh, more often than not start collecting because they can connect uh, some of their ancient coins to the Bible, whether it's Prudas or Shekels of Tyre. And so we wanted to connect you guys to him because he's, uh, first of all, a wealth of information, but he knows a lot. So that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Don't uh, don't leave. It'll probably be a two-parter because uh, it was a long interview, but we love talking to him. Uh, but that being said, we want to know what has been going across Josh's desk. <laughs> sure thing, Dean. So this week in this episode, I would like to take you all on a short journey as we explore some Ptolemaic bronze coins uh, specifically, the coin that I wanted to share this week is from the reign of Ptolemy III. It is a bronze dram uh, coming in at about 70 grams. It's a big coin, a big chunky coin. I'll show it here on the screen. Um, so at the heart of these coins, though, uh, really does lie a profound connection actually to the divine and to emblems of authority. So first, before I go into this coin, who were the Ptolemies? Uh, Ptolemy the first Soter, um, the Soter means savior. Um, he was a trusted general and a close companion of Alexander the Great. After Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, his generals, including Ptolemy, engaged in a power struggle and eventually divided the vast empire into several Hellenistic kingdoms each ruled by one of Alexander's former commanders. 
Ptolemy emerged as the ruler of Egypt, and he founded the Ptolemy the Ptolemaic dynasty, which actually endured for several centuries and became the longest running Hellenistic kingdom, all the way to the death of Cleopatra the Seventh. Uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty left a lasting legacy with several notable achievements, including the Library of Alexandria, uh, the translation of the Hebrew law into Greek, that's called uh, the Septuagint. Uh, it gave us the Rosetta Stone and much more uh, connecting us to Greek culture and Greek life. Um, so now I wanted to show a little bit about this coin that I have. Um, the obverse, we'll take a look at the obverse first. The obverse of this coin features the mighty Zeus Amon. Uh, and it's a sh uh, showing a symbol of strength, rulership, and divine favor. So during Alexander the Great's conquest of Egypt in 332 BC, they encountered the local Egyptian god Amun, who was associated with the kingship and often depicted with ram's horns. And after Alexander visited the Oracle of the Oracle of Amun uh, at the Siwa Oasis, I'm sure that's something that if you follow any stories of Alexander the Great, you'll know all about um, his, his encounter with the Oracle at Siwa. Um, Alexander, after this, Alexander the Great began associating himself with Zeus Amun, claiming the god as his true father. Zeus. The king of the gods in Greek mythology thus emerged with, with the Egyptian deity Amon. This signifies the fusion of Hellenistic and Egyptian cultures under the Ptolemaic dynasty. Such syncretic religious practices facilitated cultural exchange, fostering a more interconnected and cosmopolitan religious landscape in the Greek world. The choice of Zeus Amun on the obverse reflects the ruler's divine connection and legitimacy. So let's turn our gaze to the reverse of this coin, and it shows a singular majestic eagle taking the center stage, and this captures the essence of sovereignty and majesty. The eagle, a powerful symbol in ancient cultures, represents strength, courage, and dominion. Here, it serves as a potent emblem of the Ptolemy's authority and might. Now, on this coin, you may notice uh, a couple fascinating little aspects, uh, mostly being this little centration dimple in the middle of these coins, uh, these bronze coins. Uh, this is uh, something that comes up in questions on Facebook groups very often. Uh, like, what are these uh, centration dimples? Dimples. What are these dimples in the center here? And archaeologists and numismatists, numismatists have debated for years over the origin of these uh, dimples. Um, because they're found also on other Hellenistic bronze coins in the Seleucids um, and also in the Ptolemies after Ptolemy II. So there are two contending theories on the cause of these dimples. The first one suggests that the blank was screwed into a lathe for pre-striking shaping, resulting in a smoother and rounder coins. The face of some dimple coins even show signs of lathe turning marks. I have an example of that, and I'll bring up a picture on the screen here that'll show you some of those, um, some of those lathing turning marks uh, on the coin. The second theory proposes that pincer thongs were used to hold the blank um, in the forge until it started to get soft, leaving asymmetrical dimples if the metal got too hot for the blow to erase all traces of the tongs. Experimental, ar experimental archaeology supports the idea that large bronze coins blanks needed preheating prior to striking. A couple coins that uh, I have of, of these Ptolemaic bronzes actually show, sometimes on the obverse or even on the reverse, uh, two dimples um, at one point, which I kind of think could be just like, you know, someone mistakenly having to grab the thing twice or it moved sometime during the heating. Um, I really kind of personally support this uh, second theory. Um, uh, or maybe a combination of them both. I mean, since some of them do have uh, lathing marks on them. Um, however, there is a third theory that uh, I've not read anywhere, but in talking to some collectors and archaeologists that I know, um, there's this third theory uh, that 
discusses uh, a little bit more of a metaphysical or symbolic type of um, uh, discovery with these dimples that have to do with circles and how circles show divine symmetry and balance of nature. It's not really a theory that I put much, uh, much weight into. However, there are th- talks about that. Um, so for collectors, these coins offer not just a piece of history, but a tangible connection to the beliefs and aspirations of ancient um, Hellenistic Egypt. Each coin carries the weight and symbolism of historic significance. As you consider adding Ptolemaic bronzes to your collection, envision the stories they tell of rulership, cultural syn- synthesis, and divine favor. Each coin just becomes this, uh, I don't know, this cherished uh, cherished portal or whatever to a bygone era. Um, the imagery is of Zeus Amon, the eagle, the centration dimples uh, really just transport us to an era of myth and power. So, um, yeah, so that's the uh, that's the coin I wanted to share this week. And they make excellent hockey pucks, right? They do. They do. They, <laughs> they, 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 they glide along that ice real well. <laughs> I got to tell you, if of one of it, all of those giant bronzes from the Ptolemaic era are as satisfying as the Oz Graves we've talked mm-hmm. about. Uh, it really is. There's a lot of them, right? I mean, there's it, they're frequently available. But what a conversation piece those things oh, are. Oh, yeah, they really Just are. Giant, I mean, heavy pictures of Zeus. And a lot of times they have excellent detail. I know you have a couple. And then this beautiful eagle on the reverse. Um, and, uh, you know, they're affordable. They're mm-hmm. not, I mean, they're not hard to get. They're affordable. And again, you know, if you're looking for something to really start a conversation with people about, you hand them one of those and they're 90 grams or whatever they are, people are going to be like, wow, this is incredible. And it's 23 or hundred years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a really neat uh, version of a bronze because even then, I mean, the only competing, the bronzes of that era with the exception of the Ptolemy until you get to the Romans are generally not that big. This they're is, not, this is there unique. is one, there, there were one, uh, there, there is a series of uh, coins. I think it's, um, and if it's wrong, if I'm wrong by saying this, I will connect, click, I will comment in the note, in the uh, notes. But I, I think it was, uh, was it Antiochus the sixth? Was it who did the Egyptian Egyptianizing um, coins? Oh yeah, the bronze coins. They did produce a forty millimeter uh, coin, uh, but, but that would have been later, right? That would have been later. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. These coins, uh, they're, they're really, really impressive in hand. Yeah. And to hold yeah. something like that is, uh, it's... I can't imagine what a pocket full of those used to oh, feel gosh, like. Oh, gosh, could I mean, you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> before, the, though, before, uh, before we hear about Dean's coin, I just wanted to comment real quick about a couple resources for Ptolemaic coins. Um, mm-hmm. One of the best resources out is uh, Coins of the Ptolemaic Empire by uh, Kathy Lorber. Um, this is the first volume, uh, contains two books. This happens just to be the bronze book that I'm holding here, but the silver book, uh, as well. And the second, uh, volume of this is actually due to come out hopefully this year. I know there's been a little, um, there's, there's been a delay of some sort. Uh, they were supposed to come out in October. Uh, hmm. but the first, uh, the first set of books, uh, which can be acquired through the ANS website, Nice. Um, the first set of books covers Ptolemy I through Ptolemy IV, and uh, the new set of books will co- will cover Ptolemy V through Cleopatra the Seventh. Wow, um, that'll be great! Yeah, a couple other books on Ptolemies that I really enjoy. They're a little harder to get. Uh, this co- this book here, Ptolemy Coins: An Introduction for Collectors, is an incredible book. Um, it's out of print, unfortunately. Um, it was uh, written by R. A. Hazard. Uh, you can acquire these used. They're a little expensive um, if you can find one, because I believe only about a hundred copies were made. Mm. Um, but this is just a great book, great overview of all the Ptolemies. Um, and the another book that I really enjoy is actually a book about a collection of Ptolemies that comes out of Australia, and this is the John Hoskins collection of Ptolemaic coins. This book was put together by Colin Pitchfork, and mm. in in here you have a 
it, it shows you a nice, uh, there's a nice um, introduction about the, the coins and everything, but the really nice thing is the catalog itself. And these are all coins that he personally bought for um, this collection of, uh, of Ptolemies that cover all of the Ptolemies, except uh, he really specifically spent a lot with Cleopatra the Seventh. So there's a lot of references to Cleopatra the Seventh uh, coins. Everybody's here. favorite Ptolemy. Exactly. Right? So yeah. those are just a couple of resources, well, some of my favorite resources. Well, thanks for so, sharing those. I absolutely. really appreciate it. And uh, inadvertently, I am going to continue down our path of Egyptian greatness um, or lack thereof. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a coin from Tarsus. Uh, and uh, these to me, again, uh, it's not a totally uncommon coin. There's about, a, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 different variations, different times. Um, but uh, just a really neat coin. And so we're going to travel back before the Ptolemies, um, and we're going to hang out in the Achaemenid dynasty. Uh, so around the time of what you would uh, be more familiar with, uh, we would we would have been in the time of Xerxes the first, Xerxes the second, uh, before uh, you know, you get to Darius the third with Alexander the Great. So we're about a you know sixty years before him, and uh, but the the coin itself is minted by Pharnabazus, and which is one of the cool names of uh, ancient history. I, I, I put it up there with Lysimachus um, and Demetrios Poliorcetes. Those are some of my favorite names from this time period, and Pharnabazus is not. Uh, not uh, far off that list. Uh, so you have uh, his coinage. So basically he was a satrap in uh, uh, Tarsus uh, and governed an entire region. And they were uh, uh, secondary to the Achaemenids. They were subject to them, uh, but they did mint their own coins. Uh, so there's no uh, derricks that I'm aware of or, or uh, the, the typical siglos. Uh, so they have these coins, these, uh, 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 what's it called? The staters. And they're about the size of tetradrachms uh, or tetradrams, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, but a lot of them have this incredible beauty about them. My, my subject uh, that I'm sharing with you guys is probably uh, one of the nicest I've seen. And that's really why I bought it. Um, a lot of times, because there's so much intricate art on both sides of this coin uh, and a lot of the different types, a lot of them have one really good strike on one side and one really bad strike on the other. And so one of the hard parts about collecting these is finding ones with two good sides on them, uh, you know, especially like, you know, excellent or AU or whatever you want to call it. But it's... Um, uh, but when you do find one, it's very satisfying. So when you, first of all, on the obverse of the coin, it's uh, written Aramaic, which uh, to me is, again, it's so cool, um, you know, of the ancient languages that aren't really around anymore. Uh, that's neat. I always think of Indiana Jones when I think of Aramaic. I think of uh, biblical times. There's just a lot to like about that. Uh, but on the obverse, it's somebody who you would be familiar with if you saw the Ten Commandments, and there was a big deal about it. And that's Baal, the the god of that area. Um, and so he's seated on the chair. And if you think back to the Ten Commandments, uh, the Charleston Heston movie when they're they're moving throughout the desert, um, I'm always reminded of the the guy who keeps trying to go back to Baal uh, to solve their problems to to cheat back to him. Uh, but anyway, that's that's uh, a live active image of the god Baal on the obverse. And then on the reverse, uh, you have uh, Ares on the back. And honestly, it's one of the best, to me, the best helmeted types uh, that there is. And I particularly like them. I like uh, it, tons of coins of Athena with the Corinthian helmet. But to me, this one is uh, has a, just a beautiful helmet uh, and a really nice... Uh, reverse image. Uh, and so that's part of the reason that I bought it. What I will say about uh, Farnabazos, or Farnabazos, if, if, depending on how you want to say it, um, he has a very interesting history. Uh, as a representative of the Persians, uh, he did involve himself in the Peloponnesian War. He actually uh, 
worked on both sides of the coin. He worked for the Spartans and for the Athenians. He was uh, successful on both of those uh, ventures and was a trusted advisor of uh, Xerxes II and very, uh, um, very successful generally. Uh, what he was not successful of is one of the, the main problems the Achaemenid dynasty had was Egypt. Uh, they there are numerous times where they had to return to Egypt to tie and take control. And honestly, that's why it was very easy for Alexander the Great to walk in there because he was hailed as, you know, somebody that's, yeah, yeah, he's saving them um, from the Achaemenids. Now he ended up being kind of similar insofar as that was a satrapy of his. And, uh, but the, uh, they were excited to have him because, uh, they felt like new new leadership would be better than what they had had with the Achaemenids. So the Persians uh, tried to settle the score at least once in in uh, Egypt. Uh, Pharnabazus led that uh, and was unsuccessful, and uh, ended up uh, not taking it back in the way that they wanted to. And it continued to be a struggle until Alexander the Great uh, took over for the Achaemenids. But this. Uh, this coin is not something that you see every day just because people don't necessarily look to it. Um, I think that uh, you can do really well. You can buy some affordable versions. Mine is is probably uh, almost too nice, but the, there are plenty of affordable versions with plenty of different style. If you can get one with the helmeted version of Aries on the reverse and it's really nice, then does it really matter what's on the obverse? Um you know, they have tigers and all kinds of stuff. It's just a really neat collection of coinage uh, to involve yourself in and uh, just for all kinds of reasons. So I bring it up so that uh, you guys can see it and, and, and maybe take an interest in it. But again, that's the point is, you know, there's a lot of areas. I didn't even know about these for a long time. Um, but this is one of those uh, areas to collect that I think is really neat. And so, uh, you know, I, whenever I think it's Tarsus, I always think of Saul or Paul of Tarsus from the Bible. Um, but this gives a, a, a little different flavor to the region and uh, uh, finding out they had coins, you know, 380 years uh, before Saul and uh, how beautiful it is. So anyway, uh, that is my coming across my desk. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd share it with you guys. And with that being said, I think that... Uh, I am going to try to do a little bit of. Have you uh, have you tried to collect these, or have you gotten any of these uh, staters from that time period? No, I've ne I've never actually had one of these uh, in my collection before. Um, they're really neat coins, though. I mean, I, I, I I've I've looked at them. Uh, problem is, is sometimes my eye my eye is better than my pocketbook, so. <laughs> as they say. That's right. That's right. But yeah, it's just an, another area of history that uh, maybe you don't know a lot about, but but the best way to get in touch with it is read and then uh, collect. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, uh, I just I didn't really want to spend a lot of time um, on too much because we do have this this great interview uh, that you guys are going to love. Uh, but I did want to kind of give you guys a lesson, a cheat, so to speak. Um, a lot of you guys are... Um, involved heavily or, or keep a close eye on ancient coins. Um, a lot of us, and I'm certainly one, can't, um, what's it called? Go to V coins every day, go to the new releases, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, um, hoping that I find something that I like. Uh, the point of this is probably the simplest lesson in the history of lessons. Uh, but it's something that unless somebody says it, you might not know that it exists. So what I like to think of this is, is a lesson in making these, and I'll, I'll just use the four big examples um, that I go to the most often, but a, a way to make uh, these websites work for you so you don't have to anymore. So I'm going to share my screen here and uh, I will just take you on a very... Uh, very quick tour. So here we are. Um, we are on V coins, uh, and we will, um, I will do this for V coins, MA shops, bitter and numispids, which are the four kind of what I would call the bread and butter of ancient coin collecting. Now I'm sure a lot of you guys have, 
a lot of different places, you know, uh, HJB or, or uh, you know, CGB or any of these other places that you go to. Uh, and you can actually, um, you could actually do a similar thing uh, for this for other sites as well. Um, but these ones are the ones that I know, so I'll uh, share this with you. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to make a uh, search. Um, let's just say we're looking for, huh, okay, we'll just start with Perseus. So he's one of my uh, favorite coins of all time. I'm going to do a search for him on V Coins. And so you're going to get a lot of different types of uh, coins that are related to Perseus, Perseus or if his name is mentioned in there. And then I actually have one of the coins that's up here. Um, but what I uh, what I recommend here is you see this button right here. OK, so if you add the search to your want list, click here, click save the name as Perseus. If I spelled it right, usually. So now what's going to happen is we have a watch list I have uh, for Perseus. And Perseus is going to come up every time his name or a coin mentioned uh, that has his name mentioned comes up, uh, you will get an email. And it will be an email that's addressed to you uh, from Vcoins. And it'll say the following coins have been received uh, and uh, are ready for you to view, and it'll be a collection of Perseus coins. Uh, and so that's a way, a lot of times in ancient coins, it's kill or be killed, or it's first come, first serve, or however you want to look at it. And what happens is, is that a lot of times these items are rare, they don't come up, and if they do come up, they don't last long. So a lot of times you'll be left out in the dark when you're uh, just trying to add to your collection. So you do this on Vcoins. Uh, you can do the same here. So this is another uh, very easy to do. You know, make sure you're logged in um, and you have all of the coins of Perseus that's available on MA shops or anything related to him. Uh, but in order to get the same kind of email updates from uh, MA shops that you do from Vcoins, all you have to do is click over here, follow. And once you hit follow, it'll say, okay, now you have anytime something hits MA shops uh, that with the coin Perseus in it or the name Perseus in it, um, I'll get an email with what that is. And so that'll get, again, I'll give you a head start. I'm going to change to, um, so now you do, and Josh said he had this kind of setup. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very the same, right? I mean, and all of this is set up very easily to here. So if you're logged in, save search, boom, and we'll skip that. And it asks you, would you like to add a comment or call it something? Uh, how often do you want to be reminded about new matches? You can daily, weekly, monthly, uh, and then you have the choice of yes or no. Now you can look at, you can view your saved searches in here if you don't want to get the email, but I recommend getting the email. Uh, most of our coins don't come up very often. Uh, so, you know, an email every week, you know, with two coins of Perseus is fine by me, uh, because if, if I'm collecting that and I want that, that's where I'll go. Uh, and so that's bitter. And then let me go here and we'll go to our last stop, which is Bids. Uh, again, same, same, same. Search all Austins. A lot of times, you know, the, it, it can be right in front of you. You don't notice it. Um, and uh, so anyway, want to be notified? Yes. Save the search in my want list. And uh, so you, it gives you, ask you what you want to title it. In this case, Perseus. Save this request. And now I get all of these and I get emails on all of them. Now it gets tricky when you get into like Philip the fifth, right? Because there's in ancient times, there's a lot of Phillips. Mm -hmm. So you might have to get a little fancy with the Boolean languages. If you like have a name like Basil or um, I'm trying to think of some of the other names where uh, Ptolemy, right? You have to mm -hmm. kind of like, if you want Ptolemy the first, you have to, you know, kind of 
close that in so you don't get Ptolemy the Tenth, which is you know not as relevant. Um, but anyway, so the, to me, this is a very helpful use or a, a very helpful resource for you as you're trying to make sure that uh, you get uh, the coins that you're after uh, ahead of the guy behind you. And uh, so it's a good, good way to to end it. Also, I kind of enjoy it. Uh, Monday morning, I get my my Numis bids email with with all of these different types that I'm looking for. And I get to scroll through it. And if there's anything new that's exciting, I get to watch it. So uh, it's a nice, friendly reminder of coins that are available, but also kind of a fun little surprise whenever they show up. And again, you'll get a chance uh, to take a crack at buying something that maybe if you missed it or didn't log in until two days later, uh, you would have it would have come and gone before you even seen it. So that is my uh, portion of the deep dive. I know that's uh, seems pretty rudimentary, but you know, again, if I had learned something like that early on, um, I feel like I would have done a better job collecting. So this is something that I definitely want to share with you. I tell you, I didn't start using anything like that until well, well into collecting. Right. <laughs> um, right. But now, yeah, I, I have I have uh, watch lists and want lists and things yeah. like that set up. Very helpful. Um, yeah, it's really helpful, and it's kind of fun to see some cool in- emails sometimes, especially if, sure. if it's something rare that, like you know, you're you're looking to find that doesn't come up very often at all. That's right. Um, That's right. You just type in do a manual search every day. <laughs> search Farnabazos and then, um, yeah, you definitely get some Farnabazos coins. <laughs> so, but anyway, that being uh, said, um, I think we probably want to go jump into our amazing, amazing, amazing interview with David Hendon. Uh, he's a legend in the industry. Um, somebody that if you get the opportunity to, I highly recommend, uh, reach out to him. He, he shows up in New York city. Um, he's everywhere, right? Get to, I mean, this guy is somebody that you can learn so much from just talking for five minutes. Uh, and so that's why we wanted to share him uh, with the audience so that you guys can get a, a chance. So much to learn about uh, Judean coins and just his history in general. And for those of you that like cartooning and some of the other stuff that he was into, we do bring that up. Um, and he does have a pretty pronounced history in signing a lot of the most famous cartoonists. So just... It's just a full of information and enjoyable, but we really hope you enjoy this interview and uh, let's go ahead and kick it off. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, our interview with David Hendon. David Hendon is probably one of the most important figures in numismatic history, Um, has written numerous books, uh, particularly on coins from the Bible um, and Jewish war coins, uh, but he's covered and touched on just about everything. Uh, he's been as big a player in every facet of uh, numismatics that you can be. Um, and we're just tremendously honored to have you here, David. And uh, thank you so much for your time. That's so nice. I have so much time. <laughs> <laughs> so we were we were just chatting a little bit about uh, your, your history and where uh, you come from. You come from the great state of Missouri, which uh, I am also a part of. And we talked about how you grew up in St. Louis and then went to the University of Missouri and got your two degrees. Uh, do you want to take us on your uh, uh, tour of numismatics? We're all very interested. My mm-hmm. numismatic tour. So um, uh, when I was eight years old, which was 1953, 52, my dad had been a newly minted young uh, uh, doctor in St. Louis and was just in the midst of, uh, you know, starting a practice in a very low income area of St. Louis. And uh, I had a, you know, tiny little brother and my dad collected coins. And sometimes on Saturdays, I used to go with him to his office because he only had office hours for two hours on Saturdays, and then we would go off to bookstores and antique stores. And he loved to go to antique stores in the old Gaslight Square that used to have these dishes. And the dishes contained coins, and there was a dish for a quarter, and a dish for 50 cents, and a dish for 75 cents, and a dish for a buck for a buck. I'm sure you could get a Mark Anthony Denarius in those days. (laughs) <laughs> um, and, and we also had 
Uh, I had an uncle, one of my dad's, my dad had 10 brothers and sisters, and the one that he was closest in age to, he was also closest in friendship to. And early in life, that uncle with two of his brothers owned a grocery store in North St. Louis, and they used to uh, take old coins out of their change that they received every day. And eventually that uncle, my uncle Jake Hendon, became a well-known coin dealer uh, out of St. Louis, went to all the coin shows and sold coins and snuff bottles and Netskis and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it ran in the family. And then, you know, I, I have distinct memories of it in my maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. I, from time to time, went with my dad to the St. Louis Coin Club meetings where we met his friend Eric Newman. And, uh, you know, I know those guys. When It was so funny. One time I was teaching at the A&A Summer Seminar and uh, this has to be 18, 20 years ago. And Eric Newman was also teaching at the same summer seminar. And we we first, I think we bumped into each other at, at a dinner or a meeting. And, and he looked at my name tag and he said, no, he said, you're not related to Dr. Aaron Hendon, are you? I said, yeah, you know, it's my dad. Jake is my uncle. You know, I came to this honestly. But and honorably, but, but, you know, the, but I really became, I had other hobbies and I, and, and I had other interests. Mainly, um, I was a magician. Um, and secondly, I uh, bred tropical fish, which I sold to the local pet store in St. Louis. <laughs> and, and I was very busy with those two uh, uh, occupations all through high school. And it wasn't until after I graduated college and I, um, I flunked out of Vietnam. That I was I was not uh, uh, draftable because I had a, a stomach ulcer oh. at the time, and um, and they and they they made me not four F but one Y, which was only in a national emergency. Um, so instead, the war the war. The Six Days War in Israel broke out when I was uh, in my final week of my senior year of undergraduate. Wow. And, dur and on the third or the fourth day of the war, my dad phoned me from St. Louis. Now, mind you, it wasn't on my cell phone, right? He had to call the fraternity house. They had to call me to the phone. I had to go chat with my dad. And my dad was rather depressed. I said, what, what's the matter? He said, I just tried to volunteer to go to Israel as a volunteer after the war. And they said, thank you, Dr. Hendon. The last thing we need is middle-aged internists. If you have any friends who are orthopedics or plastic <laughs> surgeons, please have them call us. But we are looking for young people to volunteer. So my dad couldn't do it. So he called me and he said, you want to do it? I said, sure. I don't have a job. I don't have anything to do when I graduate. I had already been accepted to graduate school in journalism, which I had pr selected er a bit earlier. And so I just went over to the journalism school and I had that postponed, uh, the acceptance postponed for a year. That's a another funny story, but not numismatic related. And when I lived in Israel that year, uh, so the war was June of 67, I got there in August of 67. I stayed until June of 68. And during that year, it started off with me going to the old city of Jerusalem and becoming in love with the place and finding that a really good reason to wander around in the old city of Jerusalem was to find some coins for my dad who was still very interested, he hadn't drifted away, and he was specializing in biblical coins. And in fact, when the shekel, when the American Israel Numismatic Association was much larger and more active and they published their magazine, The Shekel, my dad wrote a 10 part or an eight part series on ancient Judean and biblical coins wow. in the early 60s or late 50s. And, um, you know, he was he was a doctor, but he was he loved studying ancient coins. And so I, I started 
stopping into all these stores looking for, you know, groups of coins, even though I didn't know anything about it. And I found, I, I, I lived in Ashkelon at this time. I started mm-hmm. in Beersheba. I lived in Beersheba for three months where I studied Hebrew in an old pond. And then I moved to my, uh, my volunteer job in Ashkelon, which was working at a, uh, at a, an American high school, uh, on, on the premises of an Israeli agricultural high school. And by the way, a 20 minute bus ride away from Gaza, where I often went on my day off uh, in, in, in 68. But it was during the times that I wandered into the shops that were mostly run by uh, um, a Muslim Arab gentleman, older gentleman, um, I fell in love with coins. These guys were so welcoming to me and nice to me and sweet to me. Maybe they saw money there, but I didn't have any money. I was a student. If I, or I, you know, I was a te- I mean, even when I was on my salary as a teacher, you know, what was it, eighty dollars a month mm-hmm. or something like that in nineteen sixty-seven in Israel? And so it it wasn't very much. There was a small volunteer stipend. So I wasn't really there to spend money. Uh, I did bring with me big money, I think a hundred bucks in my pocket of mad money, which I was eventually determined to uh, buy from my dad, which incidentally, I bought those coins from the grandfather of a young man who still owns a shop on the Via Dolorosa and his father still owns a shop on the Via Dolorosa, which is the same shop that was owned by the grandfather. And I'm uh, if I don't go to Israel where I haven't been in five years now, I still will email them uh, or Facebook them on all the holidays and they will do the same for me for the Jewish holidays. And uh, I try to stay in touch. You know, I tell people, you know, it's not the coin, stupid. It's the people (laughs) people that you met and, you know, the people that were welcoming. It, it's really good for me. I, as you guys both know, I, I, I sort of lurk around on the Facebook pages. I, I rarely post very much um, because I don't really have that much to say. But I, I read and it's really a great pleasure for me to see that because, you know, when I came to New York and I was interested, there was a Westchester Israel Numismatic Society that met every month hmm. and it had... Uh, Jay Galst, uh, Ed Janis, Fred Jacobs, Michael Druck, all people that are gone now. Me, I'm still left. But, you know, it was a group of people that was almost all interested in ancient Middle Eastern coins. And they all came up to this uh, temple in Westchester that gave us space once a month. And, uh, And that was the closest we had to a group. And now, I mean, it's amazing on with Facebook and everything and with these podcasts, you reach such a large audience, um, you know, even, I mean, I say a large audience, you know, a, to me, a large audience for a numismatic uh, event is 200 people, 300 people. Those are all the people that are interested in the United States. And it's so great to get them together. Uh, 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 for, and, and this technology really allows it. Yep, absolutely. And I would, I would, uh, I, I don't want to steer the door, the conversation so much because I just love hearing your stories. But one of the questions, we'll, what we're trying to appeal to uh, is new, new collectors. Um, and try one of the things that we both really struggle with is you only get bits and pieces of information uh, when you first start out. And there's, so many opportunities for you to be um, lost in and make mistakes, uh, which all of us have, but we're, we're trying to, you know, one, garner interest in the hobby, but then two, uh, prevent those people who are newly interested from making mistakes that we made um, so they can find joy in the hobby and not necessarily some of the pain that comes along with learning the hard way. So my question to you, uh, David, is as you have picked up uh, uh, numismatics and, and that it has become a huge part of your life. What What is it about it that, that you feel um, has really uh, inspired you to go on to have this fantastic career um, and, and really become a, an important part of numismatics, particularly with ancients? 
You know, I, I, I wish I could answer that question. What I will tell you is that it's like, you know, to me, once I made, my dad had already made that collect connection. I had been collecting coins, you know, I was putting pennies in the slots of those blue books and dimes in the slots of the green books that you didn't have to lick but had those sliding things and and i had my book of world coins where i was duly filling in countries but i was doing it not out of love but i obviously did have some kind of liking of organizing things and being organized about things even though if you look at my bookcase or my desk, I'm not all that organized around here. But <laughs> so there was something about that. But th but when I lived in Israel, there was something, and I'm not a, a, a religious person at all, um, probably in the Sam Harris uh, school of, um, of, of philosophy. Um, but something about the history of the people that lived in Israel and the fact that I was living there and I was traveling every week and soaking up all of this archaeology and also once a week I was going to these shops and really I was sitting in these shops and these people that I had met maybe once before they were letting me sit on a couch in their shops for three hours while Moshe Diane went in and out and famous archaeologists of the time went in and out because at that time there was not a lot of funding for organized archaeology there were a few very important excavations that were going on but there was a big um not big uh, there was a there was an established and legal market in selling coins and small archaeological objects and there were probably 50 shops in Jerusalem, uh, on the Jewish side and the Arab side, that sold those kinds of things as a, a specialty or a secondary specialty. And they, at the time, they weren't licensed, but eventually most of them did become licensed. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what it was. You know, there's just, there, it was just something about, you know, here I was learning Hebrew uh, uh, living there uh, and, and living in Israel in 1967, it was really interesting. I mean, <laughs> it was just, you know, 1967 was a long time ago. And I admit, mm -hmm. you know, I was uh, in my early 20s then. So, you know, so it wasn't exactly horse and buggies. But on the other hand, anybody who has been to the old city of Jerusalem in the last 20 years has not really seen donkeys um, or horses uh, uh, carrying carts up and down those roads. There had been tractors. Mm. But in huh. 1967, there were no tractors. There were no <laughs> motorized vehicles in the old city. Instead of opening for the tourists at 10 o'clock, the shops opened at 7 or 8 o'clock to deal with the wholesale business. Now they don't even think about opening till 10 o'clock. And that's if they're, you know, in wartime, I don't know whether they're open or not. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I can tell you that these people that I met, I mean, they would lock me. If, there was, if, they, if they heard an explosion, they would grab me by the shoulder and tell me, don't move and go and slam the door of the shop and keep me inside their shop for three hours, four hours until all risk of uh, 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 unease in the old city went away. You know, these were good people. I'm not saying they were experts mm. about coins, but for some reason, they or their families got involved in these coins. And it was at the same time that I was looking at all these coins saying, is this like the one that my dad has? Is that like the one that my dad has? Do you think that dad will appreciate this? Do you think that dad will appreciate that? And like I said, maybe I had a, a discretionary hundred bucks uh, for the year. And s there was something about the process that got me hooked. And what happened was I bought a bag of coins, what we would call today uncleaned Jewish bronzes, you know, direct from a, a legal source in Jerusalem. And I, and I bought this bag probably for 20 bucks or something. It was a big expenditure. 
and I put it away. And when my, it turned out that I also ended up uh, meeting a woman and getting married there. Uh, uh, fortunately, the numismatics have lasted a lot longer than the marriage. <laughs> but, uh, 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 but but my second marriage has been extremely happy and has lasted for forty yeah. years so far. Yeah, so, uh, but but yeah. But so when my parents came, I proudly gave this bag of coins to my dad, and he was really really happy and excited to get it. And then when I took my dad around in Jerusalem, uh, you know they were there for like two weeks for the wedding and everything. So so I, I took him around in Jerusalem one day. And I'm telling you that my dad hit it off better with all these Arab merchants than I did because he was closer <laughs> to their age. Uh, he knew how to bargain already. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so it, it was a it was a great father and son thing. I have three brothers. Not one of them was interested in uh, seriously interested in coins. All three had coin collections, but none pursued them seriously. And uh, uh, so so I don't know why it just it it coincided also with a time that my life um, got organized by journalism. And mm -hmm. uh, what I, I had only discovered in my third or in my fourth year of college that writing was something that I really enjoyed. And gifted at. And not only did Absolutely. I like it, but it turned out accidentally I was good at it at least according to the professor or instructor that I had in the two writing classes that I took as an undergraduate, the only two uh, A's, as I recall, that I ever had as an undergraduate. So, so I looked forward to this journalism thing. And the journalism thing was a, uh, an avenue of, you know, finding subjects that you could dive into and learn enough to write a thousand page feature story within a week. And then you could move along and you might or might not maintain interest in that subject. You might follow it up sometime sure. with something else or you might not. And the coin thing was something that I just kept coming back to. I had a couple of books. I had uh, 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 ancient, uh, the, the measurer, the original measurer of red book right there on my shelf over there. Um, and uh, I hadn't met him yet. I, I didn't meet him until 71 or 72 at the ANS. That's a good story. Um, <laughs> so I, I moved to New York in 1969. I became a journalist. And I had given all those coins to my dad. And then I don't know exactly what, oh, I guess that for some reasons, I saw maybe in my capacity as a journalist, somebody in my office got an auction catalog for this company called Stax. And I guess they were looking for publicity for their auction. And somebody flipped it on my desk and uh, because I was the new kid and I, I had to do all the shitty assignments. And I didn't know <laughs> anything about, uh, uh, you know, that level of the business or anything. Uh, but I had seen that my dad had some catalogs from this company, Stacks. So I didn't give them any publicity, but I did uh, attend one or two of their auctions. And I did found out, find out that they had an upstairs place where they actually sold a few ancient coins. And there was some guy named John Burnham who knew about ancient coins. And um, so that became one of my hangouts. And then I found out about these guys at Harmer Rook. Uh, 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 Joe Rose and and his guys and you know so I used to go up at lunch times and find out about them and, and through that I met up with these guys that met at the ANS on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the ANS library used to be open on Saturdays and then it was closed on Sundays and Mondays, and uh, uh, coin guys used to hang out there, and I hung out at this one, uh, one one time, I mean, I'd gone up there and there were these two guys, Fred Jacobs and Ed Janis, both very nice guys, both about eight or 10 years older than me, both sort of very eager to share their interest in Judean coins. Ed Janis was interested in Roman provincial coins and Fred Jacobs was interested more in the biblical and Judean coins. 
And so they used to meet up there on Saturdays. And one time I met up there on Saturdays, I guess it, it must have been in the early 70s. It couldn't have been easy for me because my daughter was born in 72. So, I mean, maybe it was a way that I escaped a screaming baby in the house. But it was it was around that time or maybe even before she was born. And as I walked into the library, uh, Fred and Ed are sort of talking together. And uh, Frank Campbell, the librarian, is talking to this short bald guy and Fred and Ed tell me right away that's measure that's measure himself mm -hmm. and I said whoa you know like what's he doing here and I don't know he's doing research and he has a close relationship with the ANS so I have my head in a book anyway and I'm doing some research on some obviously very crude article that I was writing at the time and um, uh, th there came a time on that day when I, I, I say it was a coincidental thing, but probably Mesher got up to go to the stacks and I immediately got up so I could go bump into him in the stacks. <laughs> so I, I, I got up and I bumped into him and, and I said, oh, hi, you know, my name is David Hendon. And he introduced himself and he was very um, rather abrupt as you sometimes feel that Israelis are. and. I actually asked him a question, a research question. I don't re remember what it was. It had something to do with the Maccabee coins. And uh, he blew me off. And then I asked him a very intelligent follow-up question so he would know how smart I was. And he blew me <laughs> off. And then I asked him one more question that was also a smart question but wasn't exactly related to the previous questions. And he blew me off and went back to his work and I went back to my work and I was totally crushed. Oh, and on man. Wednesday, I got a call from Ed Janis. And Ed Janis said, after you went home, Meshurer came over to us and asked who was the guy asking all the good questions. Can you come and meet him next week? <laughs> so, you know, it, just a matter of meeting. I mean, he became... My, I, I would call him my mentor, but we also became best friends. We, you know, we were involved with each other's families and uh, each other's estates, and uh, we loved each other, and we and we stayed close to each other. I published and edited uh, his his book in the United States, and he edited mine and taught me so much. And it was also the pleasure of meeting somebody like him and also Dan Barag, who is not as well known in the United States, but certainly has published as, as, as much uh, uh, in, the, in the article uh, way uh, as Meshwer. Um And the other people that I met in Israel, you know, they all, they all made it seem normal to be interested in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, by the way, it took over for everything. I no longer have tropical fish and I retired from performing magic <laughs> when I performed at an ANS gala about 15 years ago. And um, I just said, I, I just can't do it anymore. I, I, I did too nervous. You're not, you're not hanging out down at Tannen's Magic, are you? <laughs> well, I, I hung out at Tannen's Magic for many, many years and I would say I hung out at Tannen's Magic for so many years that none of the g new young guys at Tannen's Magic would know me. But I also <laughs> hung out at the other magic place. Um, now I'm trying to think of what the name of it was. It was the one that Houdini once owned. Mm -hmm. And Al Flasso was the mm -hmm. guy who ran that magic shop. And I hung out there a little bit in 1970 and 71. It might have been called wow. Flosso's Magic Shop. Um, wow. My magic teacher from St. Louis, by the way, this is all going to come back to numismatics in one minute. My magic <laughs> teacher in St. Louis, who I started becoming friends with when I was nine years old, moved to the West Coast and became the founding host at the Magic Castle. Oh, and wow. I was never, I never visited him at the Magic Castle and I sort of Sad to say I lost touch with him, but I didn't lose touch with magic over all those years. 
And interestingly, I have a, 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 a was called to my attention by my friend and colleague Uta Wartenberg Kagan, uh, the president of the ANS, uh, last week, that there was a fascinating auction in London of uh, a magician's library and collection. And in that library and collection was a wonderful set of uh, uh, the magic of coins, you know, a, 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 a whole multi-volume set going back into the 18th century. By the way, we ended up dropping out on that set at $6,000. No. But there were also a number of magical gimmicks that mm -hmm. magicians used to do magic tricks um, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, 150 years ago. Um, Two-headed coins, coins that got smaller, coins that disappeared, coins that merged. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get into that because I'm not like Penn and Teller. I don't kiss and tell. Um, <laughs> I kissed uh, Teller one time, but he told oh, yeah. Uh, son of a bitch that he wouldn't talk. Uh, no, uh, uh, I, I really, I do, I do go back very deep in the magical world, and I, and I loved it. But the interesting thing is that I'm just preparing, and I, I don't know when you're going to air this, but I'm working on, and my deadline is not for another couple of months, an article for the ANS magazine about coin magic. And I am finding it, I'm doing research on it every day, and I am finding it so fascinating. You know, uh, the first thing, of course, that any writer, you know what any writer does these days, the first thing they do, any good writer, you give your assignment to chat GBT and you see what they say. And, uh, <laughs> and, and of, of course, of course, it's nothing like you're going to write, but you find out whether there's a lot known or a little known, and then you press it. And the interesting thing is that there is all of these citations saying that, well, obviously, magic tricks with coins began when coins began, because mm -hmm. people were always looking for something that was sort of ordinary and everybody had in their hands. And of course, the, the early example of the of the first magic trick is there are two. One is the cups and balls, you know, that old routine where mm -hmm. the balls are under the cups. And the other one is very interestingly for antiquities collectors, because I have actually seen these are bowls that were made as far as I can see as early as the Bronze Age that you that looked like they were filled with water and you would dump them out and set them down again. And then the water would leak into the main portion of the bowl from a slightly hidden second portion and i have no doubt that some of those were used in cult magic um but there are no there are no citations oh. uh, i mean there are a few there are a few citations in ancient literature which i have but 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 here's what i'm wondering so how about some of those really cool brockage coins you know maybe they were or are a double-headed coin or a one-sided mm. coin. You know, maybe they were made Especially accidentally, made. but maybe they were snarked out of circulation by somebody who figured that he could flip a coin. And by the way, when they flipped the coin, do you know what it was called in ancient Rome? What was it called? Heads or ships. Because all of the Roman Republican coins had a head on one a side a and a ship on the other side. Interesting. How amazing yeah. of the things wow. that I learn in numismatics, you know? <laughs> well, we hope you enjoyed our interview with David. Um, again, we'll, we'll have this broken into a couple sections and then we might, you know, release a short or something like that just uh, based on some of the stuff that he talked about. Um, but we'll, we will always invite David back. He is always welcome, a great guest. And uh, so that wraps up this week. For us, uh, as always, uh, make sure you leave comments. Uh, if there's something that you want uh, addressed or you want, to, want us to talk about, uh, we're certainly open to it. There's lots of, lots of questions out there about ancient coins that we're happy to answer what we know of. Um, so like, and subscribe, tell a friend, uh, we want to grow this podcast as much as we can. Uh, and at the same time, make sure that the, the content is usable or an interesting for you guys, uh, as much as possible. Uh, 
other than that, I don't have much else other than uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and we'll look forward to talking to you on the next one. Have a great day.